The single most stunning economic story of the last few decades has been the rise of China. From 1980 to 2020, China's economy grew more than 75-fold. Huge new cities were built, hundreds of millions escaped poverty. It was the largest and most rapid improvement in material conditions on record in modern history. Let's go back. When the economist Adam Smith was writing in the 1700s, he considered China to be one of the wealthiest countries that had ever existed. But after decades of war and instability in the 19th century and early 20th century, China began a rapid decline. Up until a few decades ago, China was one of the poorest countries on earth. But now China is an economic powerhouse Economists predict that it will overtake the U.S. as the largest economy in the world in this decade. People called it the Chinese miracle. You can hear some people describe this miracle as a straightforward story of the free market. They say, it's a simple story. China was poor, then the economy was freed from the grip of the state. Now China is rich. But this is misleading. China's rise was not about the triumph of the free market. To understand why, we have to look at what happened to other countries which remade their own economies in the same period, often to disastrous effects. Since the 1980s, free market policies have swept the globe. Many countries have undergone far-ranging transformations, liberalizing oil prices, privatizing entire industries, and opening up to free trade. But many of the economies that were subjected to markets overnight have since stagnated or decayed. None have had a growth record anything like the one seen in China. African countries endured brutal economic shrinkage. Latin America experienced 25 years of stagnation. If we compare China to Russia, the other giant of communism in the 20th century, the contrast is even more staggering. Under state socialism, Russia was an industrial superpower, while China was still largely an agricultural economy. Yet during the same period, the Chinese reform led to an incredible economic growth. Russia's reform led to a brutal collapse. Both China and Russia had been economies that were organized largely through state commands. Individual players could only act within the structures set by state planning. Think of playing foosball. Each individual player can only be moved along with the rod to which it is attached. It is a rigid setup. You can only go back and forth or rotate. Market reforms in both Russia and China was like moving from foosball to an actual soccer game. Players now could move freely. But while Russia jumped right into the game without setting up a proper stadium, rules or jury, in China, the state took the lead in setting up all infrastructure. The state built the team, it trained the players, educated the coaches and designed an overall strategy. Russia followed the recommendations of the most quote-unquote scientific economics at the time, a policy of so-called shock therapy. As a basic principle, the idea was that the old plant economy had to be destroyed to make space for the market to emerge. Think of shock therapy like knocking over a Jenga tower after a short period of pain. Russia was supposed to emerge as a fully-fledged capitalist economy almost overnight. The leader of the plan announced it was a way of destroying communism in Russia. When Russian President Boris Yeltsin took power, he eliminated all price controls, privatized state-owned companies and assets, and immediately opened Russia up to global trade. So what happened? In a word, catastrophe. The Soviet economy was already in disarray, but shock therapy was a fatal blow. The shock therapists had predicted some short-term pain, but what they did not see coming was how severe, destructive and permanent the effects would be. Consumer prices spiraled out of control. Hyperinflation took hold. Government coffers were looted, GDP fell by 40%. The shock therapy recession in Russia was deeper and longer than the American Great Depression by a large margin. This was a disaster for ordinary Russian people. HIV infections, alcoholism, childhood malnutrition and crime went through the roof. 
Life expectancy for Russian men fell by seven years, more than any industrialized country has ever experienced in peacetime. In 2006, Russian life expectancy was still several years lower than it had been in 1986 under the Soviet Union. It turned out that Russia didn't get a successful free market overnight. Instead, it went from a stagnating economy to a hollowed out wreckage dominated by oligarchs. If simply getting rid of price controls and government employment didn't make a country prosper, and in fact destroyed its economy and killed huge numbers of people, then clearly the rapid application of free markets was not the simple solution. When Deng Xiaoping took over the leadership of China in 1978, the country he inherited was still desperately poor. In 1980, China had a per capita GDP of just $194. That was less than Sudan and Haiti, and almost half of Niger. The Chinese leadership knew they needed reform. As I show in my book, How China Escaped Shock Therapy, Throughout the 1980s, the Chinese leadership repeatedly considered implementing the same type of sudden reforms that Russia had pursued later. The idea of starting from a clean slate seemed attractive, and shock therapy was widely promoted by quote-unquote scientific economics. Programs for rapid price liberalization were prepared and then withdrawn twice. But in the end, they decided not to pursue shock therapy. Unlike the free market economists in Russia, economists in China approach change like a game of Jenga. Take out many pieces at once and the whole thing falls apart. Take out one piece at a time and you can win the game. Instead of knocking over the whole Jenga tower at once, China reformed itself in an experimental and gradual way. Market activities were tolerated and actively promoted in non-essential parts of the economy. China implemented a system of what they called dual-track pricing. State-owned enterprises and farmers had to deliver their quotas to the government at a certain price set by the government. But if they managed to produce more, they could sell their surplus at a market price. China was learning from the real story of the world's most developed nations countries like the United States, Britain, Japan, and South Korea. Each of these, in their own way, managed and planned the development of their economies and markets, protecting early-stage industries and controlling investment. Free market economists thought this system would be a disaster. The American economist Milton Friedman wrote an open letter to Deng's premier Zhao Ziyang. He said that the dual-price system was a bad idea and that China should, quote, free prices and wages in one bold stroke, end of quote, just like in Russia. But China's leaders didn't listen. And while Russia collapsed after following the shock therapy program, China saw remarkable success. The state kept control over the backbone of the industrial economy, as well as the ownership over land. As China grew into the new dynamics of its economy, State institutions were not degraded to fossils from the past, but were often the drivers at the frontier of new industries, protecting and guaranteeing their own growth. China today is not a free market economy in any sense of the word. It is a state-led market economy. The government effectively owns all land and China leverages state ownership through market competition to steer the economy as a whole. The shock therapy approach advocated around the world was a failure. While Russia collapsed after its sudden transformation, China's gradual reforms allowed it to thrive. And that made all the difference. I'm Isabella Weber, Assistant Professor of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst for the Gravel Institute. <laughs>